Lu, and welcome to a new episode of Digital Confetti, where we share with you strategies so that way you can repurpose your content and sprinkle it all across the internet so people can find out how amazing you are. Are. Yes, I'm talking about you. That's right. So happy, happy Friday. Listen up, friends. Here's a quick question for you. Did you know that 104 million people listen to a podcast in the last month? I don't know about you, but I do that a lot now. Now that I could drop off my daughter at school, I'm like, ooh, what do I want to listen to? Yeah, that's right. So imagine if you could reach that same audience with your live stream. In this episode of Digital Confetti, you're going to learn all the things about taking your live stream and repurposing it into a podcast. So I'm going to share with you three reasons to turn your live stream into a podcast, even an audio course. Yes, that's a thing. And even an audio book. Yes, we're going to have a full geek out session. Plus, you're going to learn how to reach subscribers on new platforms such as Apple iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and so much more. And the reason why you're going to be super excited is because I have the amazingly wonderful Mike Alton. Now, listen, friends, if you don't know who he is, he is an award winning blogger, speaker and author of The Social Media Hat. He's also the brand evangelist at one of my favorite brand partners, which is Agora Pulse. And that's where he strengthens relationships with social media educators, influencers and agencies. He's the co-author of this amazing book. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's called The Ultimate Guide to Social Media Marketing. Yes, he is my co-author alongside with Jen Herman and the amazing, beautiful Amanda Robinson and Eric Butoh. So you can find that book everywhere, P.S., by the way. All right. So if you're just tuning in, let me know where you're watching from. I'm here in beautiful, sunny San Diego. And my good friend, Mike Alton, where are you at? Where are you at, my friend? Hello, hello, hello. I am in St. Louis. St. Louis. There you go. That's what's up. That's what's up. All Bring right. Oh, look. Bring in the clouds. Oh, stop. I've got I've got the sun out here, which is amazing. And Victor Nunez, who also knows because he's from SoCal. That's what's up. Right. We've got Johnny Bean, who's tuning in. And he's saying, hey, Stephanie Lou. You know what, Mike? I was talking to Tim Stone this morning. And every like voice message that he sent me, he was like, hey, Stephanie Lou. Doo -doo -doo -doo. He's like, I don't know why I always say your name. And I was like, that's funny because I always say my full name, too. I don't think there's ever an instance where I'm like, hey, it's Stephanie. <laughs> Do you go like, hey, it's Mike or hey, hey, it's Mike Alton? I say Mike and I always shorten your name. And you know, pretty soon I'm just going to say, hey, S. S, what's up? Hey, S. Let's make sure you enunciate that S and it's not just hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shout out to our wonderful, beautiful Kendra Losey, who is here. And she is what tuning in. We've got Santa Cruz in the house. We've got the whole entire crew here. You guys. Yeah. Todd Dixon is saying dream team in the house. You guys go ahead and let your comments flow. Say what's up to the whole entire crew. Mike, we are talking about turning your live stream into a podcast. Why? Why? Convince me. Because I know you've been like on me like forever and now I'm listening now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're going to listen. Everyone else is going to listen. So you're going to turn on my screen sharing or do I need to turn it back on again? Yeah, no, go for it. Here you go. You're going to show that up. Sweet. Because this is the reason. Podcasting's on the rise. And by on the rise, I don't just mean more people are creating podcasts. I mean more people are listening to podcasts. You mentioned 104 million people last month, according to the recent Nielsen data, over half of the U.S. population, that's over 144 million people, have listened to a podcast. And that is up 44% just in the past couple of years. So not only can you reach over half of the country, and of course, listeners around the world, that percentage is going up at a really nice clip. Now, from a business perspective, it makes even more sense to leverage the audio medium. 45% of monthly podcast listeners have household income over 75,000. That's versus 35% of the total population. And 27% of U.S. podcast listeners have a four-year college degree versus just 19% for the U.S. population overall. So that makes for a pretty affluent audience. Do you think your audience is listening to podcasts? Do you feel like you should be right there among the shows they listen to? What if your competition is already there? Now, personally, I'm not a podcast subscriber or a consumer, but I get it. 
I recognized a long time ago that my preferred medium for learning is reading and I'm able to understand and retain text faster and easier than any other medium. But you may be different. You might prefer to hear the information or see it in a video. You might even need to say something out loud to cement it in your mind. Your audience is the same way. A mix of multiple learning modes and preferred mediums for acquiring information. Therefore, it makes tremendous sense to create a presence on your blog, on a video channel like YouTube or Facebook, and to offer an audio podcast. So at this point, Stephanie, you're saying to yourself, yeah, Mike, I get it. That's, that's why we're here. So what's next? Well, that's exactly what we're going to dive into. You're going to learn, you know, where to great, find the great content, whether it's a video or blog post, how to record that content into an audio version. If you're not already doing it as a live video, how to set up, here's the important part, how to set up the actual podcast delivery system. I'm going to share with you exactly how I started with video content with our 360 marketing squad. And I turned that into both blog and podcast episodes. I'm going to tell you all right now, it's going to be a highly technical session. So take some notes and carve out some time for yourself to rewatch this or portions of it as much as you need to. All right. So first and foremost, you need that great content. And you've got a few directions you can take, because I've done all of these, I've read my blog posts. I use this inexpensive ATR 2100 USB microphone to record an audio version of a blog post, or you can talk about your blog posts. You can interview other guests about related topics, just like we're doing right here, or you can do the Facebook live show approach and export the audio from those shows. In a quick programming note, I saw this morning, and I was sharing this with you, Stephanie, that Facebook is going to delete live shows that have been recorded after 30 days. So if you aren't already getting into that habit of downloading the HD recording of your shows, do it now and go back and grab the other ones because by May 26th, they'll all be gone. I know. Those okay, videos, just stop. Uh, you, you, yeah. you just yeah, yeah. like snuck that in there. And like, <laughs> you guys, did you just hear that? So Mike yeah. got a notification on his Facebook dashboard, pretty much saying that your Facebook lives, the ones that have already been published, PS, by the way, by the end of May, they're gone. And I was like, what? No way. So that is that to me was freaky, right? Because I have so much content that's there. And so in the next episode, PS, by the way, friends, if you're curious on, well, how do I get my videos off of Facebook? I think that's going to be the next episode for Digital Confetti. There and so go. if you want to be notified the next time that we go live, head on over to Lights Camera Live. Uh, forward slash DC, and I'll show you all the ways that you could do it. Because most people don't know this, Mike, but we're on Restream right now, and Restream automatically records your video and stores it for you. And it could be in HD or standard definition, whatever it is, but you could download it and then repurpose it. So, yeah, you heard it here first, or actually, you heard it from Mike. I heard it from Mike. But yeah, your Facebook lives are going away. And when I say Facebook lives, let me clarify I'm saying Facebook live video, not your lives in general. <laughs> Yeah, so the videos will still be there for you and your audience to play. You just yeah. won't, you'll no longer have the download option that you do today. Right now, you could go back to your Facebook page and go to a video that you uploaded or streamed years ago uh, and download it still. Oh, good. Okay, so they'll still exist. You just can't download them. Right. Got yeah, it. You just can't download okay. them. Uh, so what happens is after May 26th, you then st what starts a rolling 30-day window. So from that point on, your new lives, you'll have 30 days to go back and download them. Uh, but to your point, there are much better methods. So everyone should watch your next show uh, because the videos that you get from Facebook aren't HD quality. No, they're not. No, they're not. So thank you for making that clarification because I thought you were just... Yeah saying that the videos were going to be gone, which freaked me out oh, yeah. because when I repurpose it, I embed the video into my blog post. Yeah. Right. But then, you know, I've actually noticed too that some of my videos don't play in my blog post anymore because it'd be like, oh, someone said there's a copyright claim or whatever, which sucks because sometimes when you're you're going live into like groups or whatever, they be like, hey, you're infringing on stuff. And I'm like, that's me. But anyways, continue. <laughs> yeah. So for the rest of this, I'm going to be using our 360 Marketing Squad. We did this fortnightly Facebook live broadcast with Jen and Amanda. And together we produced a season of 10 episodes about a year and a half ago uh, that were broadcast to Facebook. They were uploaded to YouTube and they were published as blog posts. And that also gave me 10 different audio files. 
So once you've mapped out the content that you're going to create, and specifically how you're going to turn that into audio content, it's time to begin. But for the first couple options that I mentioned before, it's as simple as using an app like QuickTime or GarageBand or even Voice Recorder to record yourself speaking. And that can be scripted or outlined or entirely off the cuff. That just depends on you and how comfortable you are speaking. Now, for the option of interviewing someone else, it's only slightly more complicated. If they're local to you, you can record a face-to-face -face interview using the same mic and setup. You can also use your iPhone and record a Lavalier microphone. But these days, it's far more common to conduct interviews remotely uh, using Zoom or in this case, you know, we're just going live, which is great. Or you could do what we did and have that Facebook Live as a base. At the time, we were using Skype uh, and using Ecamm to broadcast. I call it a Facebook Live video. Fortunately, we don't have to use Skype anymore because that really impacted the quality. Yeah. Yep. But uh, once we began to broadcast, the entire production was recorded to both Facebook and the producer's system via Ecamm, either Stephanie or myself, whoever was running that particular show. You can then download the video from Facebook like we just talked about or use the file created by Ecamm and use an app like iMovie to import the file to get the audio. So you can also use Ecamm to bring in one or more Skype guests and record locally if you want that interview format and the capability of Ecamm for branding, but necessarily don't want to broadcast live. Um, but at this point, you've got an audio or a video file recording of your content, whatever content you decide to create. Now, I'll be the first to admit I'm not a professional podcast editor. What I'm about to share is what I'd consider to be the absolute basics of what to actually edit. I essentially did nothing to my raw recorded files. I may have trimmed the beginning and end a little bit if there was some dead air or something like that, but that's it. I didn't spend time editing out any other part of the production. So our podcast episodes are exactly what originally aired. You may want to spend more time. I know. I was like, there is Gasp so included, much. Right? <laughs> yeah, I was like, there is so much that we had said in those episodes, unfiltered, uncontained. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and depending on the, the nature of the recording and the broadcast and what you're trying to accomplish with your podcast, you might edit that out. Some podcasters that I have seen who start with live video They'll do a lot of audience engagement, interaction up front, and then they'll start the recording because they'll use a different system for recording and kind of make it the official, official recording where they're not going to acknowledge the audience during that portion to save themselves from having to edit that out later. Because like when we were doing live videos, you know, somebody might comment and we bring it on screen and we talk to that person, answer that question, there'd be, the, be that engagement. That may or may not sound great from a podcast perspective, right? Because remember, podcasters, they're just they are just listening. Um, so you have to decide for yourselves how much editing you're wanting to do and what you want to uh, accomplish. Experienced podcasters, they go into it knowing that they can't edit. So when they say something wrong, they might actually pause for a few seconds and then start again because they know that flub can be... Ch 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 oh, they might pause for a few seconds and then start again since they know that flub can be chopped out. See what I did there? Yeah. I did. I was like, you are so <laughs> clever. I'm going to put myself in the but, background just for a second. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I did do two really crucial steps though. I added an intro and I added an outro. So when we first launched the 360 Marketing Squad, I used iMovie to create a 60 second teaser video. And I used some of the templates built in graphics and a soundtrack and I wove in some video clips from our first show along with some custom text and that turned out pretty cool. And that little clip actually made for a great podcast intro except there's no voiceover. So using iMovie, I recorded my own voiceover for the teaser, I basically read the text that was in the video knowing that there'll be no video for the podcast. And I saved that as intro.mp4 my desktop. And for the outro, we'd already done something similar by taking the first six seconds of the teaser video and splicing that out to create a quick bit of music. And we used that to kick off and end our live broadcast a few times for that nice professional touch. Well, that worked out perfectly. Then each episode, I saved that as outro.mp4 to my desktop. Now, last fall, I started my own podcast, Marketing Hyperdrive. And for that podcast, I set out to create custom intro and outro. I scripted it. I went to Facebook Sound Library, I think it's called, and downloaded some custom music that kind of fit the, the tone and the feel I was trying to go for for that particular podcast. And I paired those together and created similar intro and outro 
files. Now, since I was dealing with video files for each of these original episodes, and that's probably what you'll be doing if you're using, you know, turning Facebook Lives into podcasts, I used iMovie for everything. I'm on a Mac. If you're on PC, you can use something else. And if you're creating strictly audio files, you probably go with a different app like Audacity. But I'd start a new project. I drag the episode video file into that little media area, and then I drag the intro and outro files in as well. And I could add them in order to the timeline and episode and edit the episode as needed. And when you pull it into the timeline, you can detach the audio and then just delete the, the video. So now you've got an intro audio and the episode audio and an outro audio. Again, this is where you could quickly do any kind of editing or splicing if you need to. And I repeated that for each of our first 10 episodes. Now, one quick note here. If I'd have had more time, I would have created a 30-second bumper. That's a little commercial about you. In our case, it would have been about 360 Marketing Squad, which I would have inserted about halfway through each episode. And unfortunately, we did make a point of talking about our membership community at some point during pretty much every broadcast. So that information is there just in a very conversational form. You might do that differently the next time. So now you've got your audio files. And I want to recommend that you have at least four episodes recorded and edited. Now it's time to set up your podcast infrastructure. This is the service that you're going to use to upload, host, and distribute your podcast episodes. Now I looked at a few services and eventually settled on Libsyn, largely because it looked easy, and it is, and Pat Flynn recommended it. So thanks, Pat. Libsyn's a paid service, uh, but it's not much more than what you're likely paying for your website, which makes sense. You're essentially creating a second website, an RSS feed. And once you get your Libsyn account set up and you start to upload podcast episodes, they'll appear on a podcast page that Libsyn provides for you, as well as populate an RSS feed that you'll use to update iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and more. Sound cool? So you start by creating your Libsyn account. And plans start as little as, gosh, I think it's five or seven bucks a month. And they're based on how much you upload per month. So if your podcast episodes tend to be, and that's how much you upload in size. So the podcast episodes tend to be about, say, 10 megabytes in file size. You can upload four or five per month on that least expensive plan. This is why I had you produce your first four episodes, because you can look at them and immediately tell what your typical upload is going to be. Now, in my case, because we were doing one hour broadcasts, those episodes averaged like over 125 megabytes in size. So we needed oh, to upgrade, goodness. I know, to this really expensive plan. And the thing is with Lipson, if you've got a lot of episodes to upload, even if it's just initially, you'll need an even higher tier plan at first. But you can downgrade later on. So that plan can change from month to month depending on how many you need or how much you need to upload. In our case, I needed to upload all 10 of our episodes in that first month. So I needed the top tier plan. But now that we're up and running, we're paying $7 a month and we've just been paying $7 a month ever since. Now, once you sign up and subscribe to a plan, you need to spend a few minutes customizing your podcast show. So you're gonna need a series of custom graphics. So be prepared to fire up Canva or Easel for that. And the next few steps that we're gonna go through they're going to be pretty detailed. So take a picture, uh, whatever you need to do so that you can reference this later. So here's what we're going to do to set up that podcasting account. You're going to go to settings and then show settings, and you're going to fill in all this information, your show title. Hopefully you know that. Your show slug. This is going to be this little subdomain within Libsyn.com. So in our case, it was 360marketingsquad.libsyn.com. There's an actual page that you could go to and you could see our show podcast. You're going to type in a show description, uh, the website address, which is like your business, if you're doing this on behalf of your business. Um, you're going to put in an iTunes show type. And for most of you, this is going to be episodic. The other option is series, which means somebody should come in and watch episode one at the beginning and continue through, right? For most of us, for this kind of a show, like what, what Stephanie and I are doing right now, you could watch this show today. You wouldn't necessarily have to watch all the shows that she's done up until now. But if it's you know some kind of audio form of how to get away with murder, that's a that's a series. You need to watch it from the beginning. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> that funny. Uh, if if you put in your email, go go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, if you could only hear the background noise that I have, I'm like, yeah, how would I get away with it? <laughs> how, how to get away with murder. We need that information. And we need it from the start. You can't just go to the end of how to get away with murder because then you missed all the preceding steps, which are probably kind of important. Safety tip. So collect, uh, select Libsyn Classic Feed. Uh, and there's a, there's a little drop down menu for that. Um, and then you're going to create and upload your podcast artwork. This is going to be a square image. That's 14 by 1400. And you're going to want to upload a widescreen image. It's going to go at the top of your page. And that should be like a 16 to 9 ratio, at least 1400 pixels wide. You can change the directory theme color to one of your main brand colors and then click on save. And note that once you have your show accepted to iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, you're going to want to come back here and fill in the direct links to your podcast on those platforms because those links will be displayed as clickable icons on your podcast page kind of like when you go to your website and you've got like a facebook icon and a twitter icon that takes a visitor to your profile on those platforms it's the same deal next go to settings and edit content categories at a category for your podcast probably business i don't know you guys could be listening from yeah. you know, all, all manners of verticals i was going to ask you is there how much research did you do for 360 when you're putting together our podcast? I did a fair amount. As I recall, this was about a year and a half ago. Um, I went and looked at other similar podcasts and I also looked at the platforms themselves in terms of how they were displaying podcasts. Cause again, like I said, I'm not a podcast listener. I've worked from home for years, so I don't have a commute or anything like that. Uh, and listening is just not really my thing. I prefer to read. So I was really going into this blind. If you're a podcast listener already, you have an innate familiarity with podcasts. You know what they look like. You know what they sound like. Uh, you know how they're arranged on your favorite player, whether that's Spotify or iTunes or something else. Uh, so yeah, I was really starting from scratch. So once you get into here, you're going to fill in um, the author, you're going to fill in your language. That's important if this is English or something else. And it's really important. You have to select your iTunes categories here because that's where your podcast is going to be listed on iTunes. The iTunes categories are super important. They rank podcasts in these categories depending on how much they're downloaded and some other factors that we may get into later. And the you want your podcast to be ranked as high as possible on an appropriate category because it will feed itself, right? If you're a business podcast and you're on the business category and people are downloading it, that's going to help you rank higher. If you're a business podcast and you put yourself on fantasy and fiction, I don't know, I just made that up. Um, no one there is going to be interested in your podcast. So they're not going to subscribe. Are you sure they're not going to download. I'm, I, feel, well, okay. I feel like if I did I like making some assumptions, I would make some fantasy and fiction of... <laughs> what it's like to live stream at home. <laughs> I feel like that's what we're creating right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last step uh, was, was setting up Libsyn. And again, you could use a different podcast hosting service. You don't have to use Libsyn. And a lot of these steps will be, the, 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 the terminology will be different, but the steps will be the same. You'll still have to upload your artwork and, and make some decisions along those lines. So the last thing is go to destinations and then podcast page. And here's where you're going to upload that header image. And you're going to be able to create a little fave icon. Uh, that's just a tiny little square that shows up in the, in the browser. That can be 300 by 300. You can select brand colors for your title, your theme, and links. And you can add a producer message. This is text that will appear above your episodes. Uh, some examples that I've seen uh, describe the frequency. You know, hey, this is a weekly show based on this or something like that. Just to let people know, clue them in if they're coming to your page for the first time, that that's what the show is about. And then here's what our page looks like. You can add additional pages and there's some widgets that Libsyn provides, but I honestly kind of found them uninteresting. Uh, most listeners, they're going to come from the main distribution channels, not my podcast page. So this is honestly just a nice looking place that I can promote the podcast and give people an easy way to find their subscription service of choice. You know what? I'm, so I'm going to jump in there real quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're on a roll, but I was, That's right. 
On our last episode, Kelly and I were talking about how important it is for you as a live streamer to have a media kit. And so I think when you also expand your reach and your audience to say, hey, I even also have audio listeners, podcast listeners, things of that sort. And in your media kit, you take a screenshot of this. I think that would be just more added value for you, especially if you're reaching out to sponsors, advertisers to get in on your show. Totally agree. And one of the metrics that Libsyn will give you is downloads. That's that's the podcast version of views or viewers or listens or readers, right? To listen to a podcast, you have to download that audio file. So that's what the host measures. And you can go into your Libsyn statistics and see exactly how many downloads you got last month and the month before and all time. And you can divide it up by episode. So typically your most recent episodes are going to get the most downloads, but that's what, that's the metric that most podcasters will point to first. There's other deep dives they can go into, but like you said, for a media kit, you could say, Hey, we got a million downloads last month. Which is pretty impressive. Sounds I think like so. Sounds like Hell yeah. Number. Yeah. You now I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to go back to my media kit and and add the podcast there too. Yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't get a million dollars last month, but you know, this is this is because we don't we haven't added anything to this and we haven't promoted it. Uh our last episode was 2019. So it's been almost yeah. two years. Um we, you know, we need like so a reunion episode. And we just use this as an example. Yeah. But yeah. if we were to restart this either restart the live show or restart it just as a podcast, we'd promote it, right? We'd share it out. We'd get people listening to it. We'd get people subscribing to it. And then just like a website or a video audience, we'd watch those subscriber numbers and those download numbers improve. Very cool. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. I like this. Yeah. So at this point, you're ready to upload your first episode. And once you start creating accounts in the various services, they'll be looking for an active feed. Now you're permitted to use a short teaser or an introduction episode here and then delete it if you want to or add to it later. Um, But what I'm recommending is you've got four episodes already edited. They're in the can, so to speak, they're ready to go. So you go to add content or you go to content and then add new episode. And the first thing you're gonna see is a big button that says add media file. And you're gonna select your first podcast episode MP3 file and upload it. And Give Libsyn a few moments to upload and process that file. Then you can click on details and you can fill in the episode title, the subtitle, and the description. Now, these can be whatever you want, but I recommend making sure that you're consistent across episodes. If you look at the previous slide, you can see we did, at least I did, 360 Markings Live colon season zero one episode one zero and if you were to scroll through this is a screenshot but if i were to scroll through right every single episode is titled the same way it's consistent and i'm not like you know starting off the next episode with episode 11 season one 360 marking live at the end right so that's a good just a habit to get into uh you make sure your primary category is in there you can add some keywords at this point you can also fill in the itunes section Here's where you would also upload artwork. Um, Typically, each episode is going to have its own graphic, a square graphic that'll be very similar to your general podcast graphic, but typically with this episode's number, maybe a title, whatever it was that you had on there, then click on publish. And you'll see now your podcast, your very first podcast episode listed on content as well as on the podcast page. Now, you're ready to set up those other subscription services, the iTunes and so on. So go back to destinations. And at the top, you'll see a quick links box. And within that, your RSS feed URL. Copy that. Your Libsyn classic feed link will look something like, in our case, it was 360marketingsquad.libsyn.com. That was the page, right, for our podcast slash RSS. I went and put it in my Evernote and I used it over and over and over again. So iTunes is first. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just saying, I was like, that's smart. I I like the idea of having simple nomenclature and organizing things Mm -hmm. because I'm the type of person where when I'm live streaming titles, you know, you, you always go for titles and whatnot. And I know that whenever I download my videos from Restream as well, 
it's, it's just like a series of numbers. It actually doesn't pull out the title. And I was like, oh, I should totally reach out to support and just be like, you know, <laughs> yeah. it would be nice if you actually use the title of what I called this and not just a string of numbers. But yeah, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then what you want to do next is go into our iTunes. You need to have an Apple, Apple ID. So if you're not already an Apple user, you can create one. It's free. Um, then you sign in to the iTunes Podcast Connect. And up at the top left, wherever that is for you, there's a little plus button. Um, and that's where you enter in your RSS feed, that link that we just grabbed in the previous step. And you click on the validate button because this is going to go out and it's going to take a look. The feed preview will load if you don't have any additional uh, validation errors, like something that, like, it's like some step you might have missed or for whatever reason doesn't recognize the file. But just take a moment, review the podcast artwork, the description, the general information, and of course, make sure that first episode is there. And if everything within that feed preview is correct, click submit. Your podcast is now submitted to the Apple Podcast directory. You'll get an email what? once your show's been reviewed. Yeah, I know. It only takes about a day. Um, so like most of the work was up front. This is the easy stuff now. It's just some series of yeah. steps, but all the work was already done, right? We set up the website. We uploaded the first podcast episode. We grabbed that link and now we're just plugging it into the various platforms, right? To get that validated. Stitcher, just as easy, right? You create a content pro provider profile. That's kind of hard for me to say. Uh, it's Stitcher. And once you're logged into your newly created account, click on this add show button. You punch in your RSS feed. Again, just copy and paste some show details and submit. And now your podcast is submitted to Stitcher. And you'll get an email once your show has been reviewed and approved. Likely within a day. I have so much appreciation for you for setting this all up for 360 Marketing Squad. I mean, it was so funny, you guys, for those of you that are watching, right? <laughs> Michael's like, oh, P.S. By the way, we made a podcast, and we're all all in our little group chat. We're like, yay, that's awesome! And he's like, no, ladies, I just <laughs> I just did this whole entire thing, you know. And I was like, oh wow, you <laughs> you did all the things. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and funny story or fun programming note: um, as a blogger and a marketer, right? I documented my process. As I went through Smart. this, right? So that's why I have this. That's why I now teach other people how to do it because I went through it my, myself. Um, and it was valuable to me, not only as a teaching tool, but again, like I said, last December, I started up my own new podcast, Marketing Hyperdrive. And I just went back through my notes and followed my own tutorial on how to do it up because it'd been a year and a half since I'd done it. Yeah. So, no, so yeah. That's, that's totally smart. P.S. By the way, if you're not sub subscribed to the marketing hyperdrive, definitely go ahead and check that out because Mike is always dropping gold. He's like one of the best storytellers out there. So make sure you hop on that. Cool, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on all the things, all the things, marketing hyperdrive. And uh, this last one, or I think it's the last one, uh, maybe one more, um, Google Play. You go to podcast, you go to g.co slash podcast portal. And then you click on get started and then you log in with your Google account. I'm sure everybody listening has got a Google account. You click on add a podcast, you review and accept the terms of service, which just says, you know, obviously if your podcast isn't very good, they're going to come take your house. That's standard, right? Then you add, enter your podcast only RSS feed and you check your email, the address in your RSS feed and you verify your ownership of this podcast feed and you click on publish podcast. And now it's submitted to Google play and you'll get an email once your show has been reviewed and approved likely within a couple of days just like all the others that's it now you've got a podcast i love it when you're like that's it and then you look at me and i'm like well i feel like you're looking at me i feel like <laughs> oh, and i'm like okay okay i think i could do that that's all right it, i'm like hyping that's myself it. up you for can this. Do this you, you can, can do, do this it. Like, you can do michael it. can do this you can do it yeah pretty much yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, once you've been accepted and listed in those three major podcast platforms, now it's time to publish the rest of them. Um, and at this point, it's a good idea to publish your next three episodes. That way you've got this nice start of four episodes available and you can start racking up downloads. Again, I'm going to stress, have those initial episodes created and available. You'll decide 
elsewhere how often you're going to publish, whether it's every day, every week, every month, however often, you know, if this is, you know, you're taking your lives and repurposing them, however often you're going live, that's how often you should be publishing podcast episodes. But have some up front. That way when you start to promote it, you give somebody something to listen to, more than one episode to listen to, and a reason to subscribe. Now, we were playing catch up on the 360 Marketing Squad. Um, so I just, we, we already had all 10 episodes. So I just published them all. So at a minimum, share to social media and to your email subscribers that you have a podcast. And when you have new episodes available, and every time encourage your fans to subscribe to your podcast using whatever service they prefer. So they'll automatically get notifications and download your new episodes. I actually built in a footer into my email template that says something like, listen to my podcast. And I just linked to Libsyn, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, <gasps> you know, to the podcast there. So people can choose, right? I, I am a Spotify user. Like I said, I don't really listen to yeah. podcasts, but I am a Spotify user. So if I yeah. want to subscribe to your podcast, that's the platform I'd choose. This is all fascinating because... For those of you who don't know, I always tell like Mike, I also nickname him the brain. I'm like, hey brain, I have this idea. <laughs> I want to I want to create this audio course and stuff. And he's like, okay, well then let's talk about that. And so for me, this is just so interesting because this is definitely something where I see myself as well as digital confetti, like really expanding out to create more content that's out there. Cause I mean, let's be honest. I mean, not everyone could always watch a video, right? And as soon as people know, like, oh, this is a tutorial, they're like, I'm gonna watch this later, right? Or I'm I'm gonna do whatever it is that I have to do and listen in the background. And I think having an audio course or just in an audio format is always helpful. Kendra was in the comments where she's like, would you make edits in iMovie versus doing them in Descript? And I was like, now that I've had my first NLP training now put into a podcast format, I am all about doing it in Descript. In fact, Mike, I didn't even tell you this, but I started recording for Master Practitioner and I'm already four episodes in. So as soon as you were mm -hmm. saying like, yeah, make sure you have like everything locked and loaded. I was like, yeah, I've got that going. Woo -woo. <laughs> That's right. And you can use services. I don't know um, if SoundWise works the same way, but I know Hello Audio, our friend Lindsay at Hello Audio was telling me that Hello Audio is a private subscription only type of platform, right? Where you want to do, like you said, an audio course. So you would upload the audio podcast to Hello Audio and you'd give your subscribers a custom link. They'd be able to use that to log in via iTunes or Spotify or whatever platform they prefer. But because it's a custom unique link to them, they're the only ones who can download that content. So That's they so would cool. be able to consume your audio course using their preferred platform without having to use a different app. Love it. All right. Let's talk about publishing and promoting because I feel like this is the other part too where they're like, if I've, if I've done the slugs and the categories and all the things, how do I make sure that people are actually listening to my live stream that's now in podcast form? Yeah. So like I was saying, you want to make sure you tell all your fans that you've got a podcast, encourage them to subscribe, tell them when you've got new episodes. And when you start to get feedback from fans on social about your episodes, ask them to leave a review. I did it. It's kind of hard and awkward sometimes, but you know, our good friend Bella Vasta emailed me, you know, said like the first time I launched it, she said how great it was. Um, I said, could you leave me a review? And she did, right? So she's one of the reviews that you read on, on Marketing Hyperdrive. Awesome. That's one of the key factors that'll actually determine how your podcast gets listed and ranked within the services, particularly iTunes. Because folks who aren't already following you, they're looking through iTunes for new podcasts to listen to, and they're gonna browse two main agent areas, uh, whatever category you chose, what we talked about before, right? Whether it's fiction and fantasy or, or business, or new and noteworthy. New and noteworthy is where Apple editors place new podcasts that they think look interesting and they think you might appreciate. And because that section gets insane visibility, being listed there can easily lead to hundreds of thousands of downloads of your podcast content. I've read so many case studies and no one can tell you exactly what you need to get listed, but it does boil down to the same key features. First of all, great artwork. 
you got to make sure that you're creating really, really good graphics, the ones that we talked about before. The audio quality has to be excellent. I mentioned I'm using an ATR2100 USB, but I also pipe it through a Behringer mixer, uh, yeah. which combined still isn't very expensive. But I'm doing that to create the best possible audio quality whenever I'm broadcasting, whether it's video or audio. For sure. Can Make I, sure can I, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Yeah, because even one of our loyal uh, viewers, Michelle Williams, was like, do you have a new mic? And I was like, first of all, there's two mics. There's mic down there yeah. and there's this new mic. So, yeah, I got I got my hands on a new Shure SMB7, 7, SM7B. Yeah. So I'm curious sure. to hear your thoughts on the audio for it. I'm not, Mike has known that I'm not used to having like a mic in my face or actually in the shot. So I keep looking at it cause it's, it's just in my peripheral. I'm like, Hey, how you doing? Um, but does it sound good? Cause I, now, now that I'm listening to you and now that <laughs> there's my husband and now, and now that there's all this, um, content that I want to put out, just this idea of repurposing the live streams into podcasts. Now I'm like more open to the idea because you make it sound so easy. But yeah, any feedback on the mic, Mike? <laughs> yeah, this helps. The, 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 the good mic helps. Uh, like I said, it's an ATR2100 USB mic from Amazon, less than a hundred bucks. The Behringer USB mixer is also less than a hundred bucks. So this particular mic is using the XLR cable output into the mixer and the mixer uses a USB line into my computer, which just means anytime I am like right now I'm on a live video or if I'm opening up iMovie or a QuickTime or whatever app, I just need to make sure that the input audio, the microphone is the actual USB mixer, not something else. And here's the benefit. If you're using, say, your Apple AirPods or something like that, and let's say that's the mic that you have, you could do it. Um, the quality of the content isn't going to have anything to do with the quality of the audio, right? But if you want to have really good audio, now you're going to have to spend time editing it. You're going to spend time pulling that audio into GarageBand or Audacity and tweaking the highs and lows and trying to accomplish that really good, rich timber that I can get without hardly even trying. I don't have to edit this. I can sound like a radio DJ with very little yeah. effort on my part. And yeah, I know that part. because I have DJ friends who've told me that. Yeah, that was the part where a couple of my friends were like, oh yeah, and then you got to put it in an audacity and do all this stuff. I was like, see, this is why I like live streaming. Because <laughs> it goes out, you're done, you're good to go. You know, all this editing other stuff. I'm like, oh man. So the Behringer and the mic that you just mentioned, both under $100. I definitely think that's worth the investment for sure. Yeah. I mean, I've got a Yeti up here somewhere uh, that costs more than those two things combined. And I don't use it because it's not as good a quality as these two combined. But the real point is to make sure you have a good mic from the start because that will save you editing. When I was doing the Marketing Hyperdrive podcast, those episodes were 10 to 15 minutes. And it was just me speaking. And the quality of audio was there. I still needed to do editing because when I was doing them for whatever reason, I was having like speaking issues. I would cough and uh, flub up my words a lot. I don't know why. I was just going through a moment. So I would have to edit that out, right? I was doing that podcaster's trick I mentioned earlier where I was training myself to be aware when I say something wrong or cough or something, just stop, start over, and you can edit that out. It's annoying to edit, uh, but it's, it's possible. But I didn't have to adjust the audio quality. And again, I've got a DJ friend who listened to the podcast. And it's funny, he could tell that it hadn't been edited, but that wasn't a bad thing. He said, you don't need to, it's fine. So hopefully that helps. Kendra, that does you help. get over that, uh, that idea that this is going to be a lot of extra work. Not really. I mean, like everything, you know, any kind of repurposing is going to take a little extra time, right? But if we make sure that the stuff that we're creating up front is as high a quality as possible, then the back end repurposing work goes a lot faster and smoother. Uh, this is frankly, you could probably push off to a VA 
a hundred percent of your show repurposing into podcasts. Oh, for sure. That's that's where I'm like, oh, P.S. By the way, Mike, as soon as this episode is done, can you send me this deck? Because I'm just going to send it over to my VA or hire a new VA that specifically focuses on just that. Because in my mind, and again, you guys are getting like, you're hearing it first. Like, I for sure am going to be rolling out a podcast. Yes, I am. I'm saying it. It's out there. OMG. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely want to have a VA that focuses specifically on podcasts. And it would be awesome and amazing to have it across all of those different platforms. Because like I said, there, there are times when you don't want to live stream, but you, there's things that you still want to talk about. You know, and so just having this option of creating content without having to be on camera is cool. But I also still like the idea of using Restream because, and I don't even know if you know this, but in Restream, like as soon as this episode is done, I could download the separate audio tracks of just you and of just me. Did you know that? I'd heard that. I hadn't done it myself. Yeah. And so I thought it was really interesting because, you know, if, if one of my guests is saying something that's absolutely amazing and I have background noise, I would rather just pull their audio for when they set it at that exact moment and not be the, <laughs> the background noise on top of that. So cool. Yeah. So then uh, the last two quick points I wanted to make about iTunes and then we're done unless we have more questions is uh, first to get in a new noteworthy. One other aspect is the number of downloads that you get within a very short amount of time. That's why that promotion is so important. When you have the podcast up and when you've got four episodes up, email your subscribers, share to your social channels, uh, get friends to help you, you know, share in your communities and th their communities. That will drive up those subscribers. And don't, you know, don't let ego stop you from asking for reviews because the number of downloads and the number of views uh, initially are going to be the key deciding factors of whether or not iTunes puts your podcast into new and notable. And if you get into new notable, you are set. It's not a requirement. If you don't get into new notable, that doesn't mean your podcast is a failure. Uh, but that's just something to hope for and uh, kind of uh, have it as a goal uh, for your initial podcast. For sure. Cool. All right, that is awesome. That's exciting. So I'm I'm excited to get this started. So my action items is I need to at least have four episodes into the hopper. I'm probably going to reach out to Easel, Annette over at Easel, and be like, hey, I need you to design some thumbnails and things of that sort. I'd be curious to hear from you um, any tips on thumbnail designs because I've heard conflicting things where like if people know you, if they know your face, then put your face on there. But if they yep. don't know you, then put an image that that emphasizes what your show is about, right? So for me, like digital confetti, I, you know, maybe I might have like kind of like the restream thing where it shows like one piece of content being shared to all these different places. But what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I found the exact same thing in my research because I did a whole nother round of research when I started marketing Hyperdrive. With 360, the branding was pretty much set. It was it was easy. We already had the, our branding. But with marketing Hyperdrive, I was starting something new from scratch and I wanted to know what should the thumbnails look like. And so I went and did some research, read a lot of articles and looked at a lot of examples. And I settled on exactly what you said, which is to have me. Uh, so I put myself... You know, and it was I so cool. You it was like, a great timing. We did, <laughs> we had done the photo shoot. So I, have, I actually have good art of me. And I worked that in, I uh, worked the title in, and I made space, uh, at least conceptually, for where like the, the title of each episode was going to go. Um, platform logos. You know, I did a whole series of graphics, and those, they, they turned out great. Um, and, and it worked. I love that. Very cool. Here's a question that we had from Todd Dixon and she, this, this was, was something I wasn't quite sure about, but is it totally safe to use Facebook's music library outside of Facebook and Instagram? I know on YouTube, YouTube's just like, go do whatever it is that you want to do. That's, that's what it's for. But Facebook, I feel like sometimes, you know, depending on what mood <laughs> is going on, it could change. But do you know this one off the top of your head? Yeah, in the hierarchy of platforms that care about what audio you use, Facebook's at the top. So I figured, and the most limiting. So I figured if I start with Facebook's library, I'm safe everywhere because nobody else cares as much. And either they're okay with that particular 
content. Those providers have given their content to the Facebook Music Library, which means you all have, we all have expressed permission to use those sound clips. And I just make sure that I give them credit. Um, so in the show notes, it says, and in the outro, I actually say in the outro, I wrote this out in a script and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it says something like music by so-and-so and so-and-so, because it was two different tracks, one for the intro, one for the outro. Very cool. So what I'm thinking is I for sure would do this in Descript. I don't know if you've played around with it yet. I know we've talked about it, but is that what you're using now for marketing hyperdrive? Well, I used iMovie because that's where my familiarity was, oh, but I, I'm pretty sure the script would be even better if you know okay. it. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then if for you your that. show, because you make your, your show fun with sound effects and all those things, where are you finding those resources? I think I used, doesn't Ecamm have them built in? Ecamm, yeah, it does. Is that where you're yeah, recording yeah, all I of think, it? I think that's where I used actual uh, the sound effects. Yeah, oh. I had to think back for a second because it's been like it's been three or four months. Because um, I used Ecamm for my uh, re initial recordings. Oh, interesting. Okay, because in my brain, yeah. the way that I'm imagining my process is I would just record straight into Descript. Because what's nice about it is that as it's recording, it's transcribing. And so when you were saying earlier, like if you flub up on a word, you're just going to keep going. Because at least for me, I could just, if I wanted to, if I wanted to edit as I was recording, I could just highlight the word and then just delete it and remove it. But if I did it in Ecamm, I wouldn't have visual, I wouldn't have a visual for it. But I guess I could still have Ecamm running in the background and then just play the sound effects. Got it. Okay. That works. Yeah. Yeah. Or your phone, you know, there's apps that you can use on your phone, uh, which is what I yeah. used to use before Ecamm had built in sound effects. Cool. Cool. So, Hey, if you guys have any questions about turning your live stream into a podcast or even an audio course, go ahead and drop your questions in the comments. Just go ahead and put a cue at the very beginning for me. That way I could easily spot it. But I would definitely say that, um, when, when I've thought about live streaming my show into a podcast, my biggest concern is plucking out the different shows that would make sense. Because a lot of times when I would have previous guests and we're screencasting, right? Like even this one, right? That we just mm. did because you had slides. It wouldn't translate very well in a podcast, um, po podcast type of show. And I think that's something that we as live streamers have to take into consideration as we're planning out our run of show. Is there anything that you'd add to that? Because 360 was a live stream and man, we talked so fast there too. Yeah, but um, to your point with 360, there wasn't, I don't think any screen sharing whatsoever. Uh, I don't think any episode really went into technical details. It was all very conversational. It was, you know, what do we think about this latest change to Facebook or how do we deal with trolls on the internet or how are we looking forward to networking at an upcoming event or what did we get out of a particular event? I mean, those, those kind of conversational topics that you didn't need to see us to get the same information. Um, but yeah, to your point, as a live streamer, as you're plotting out the content that you're going to create via live stream or the people that you're going to talk to, you'll probably have a good sense before you even get into it of whether or not that's going to make a good audio show. Very cool. Okay. Ah, I'm excited. Now I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I have to block out time. Um, it's so interesting to me because I always tell people that Lights Camera Live started because I like the fact that I didn't have to edit things. You know, you, you just go live. But what most people don't realize too is that even when you're live streaming, there is still the prep. And I guess like in my mind, it's easy for me to do the prep work beforehand, right? Because I like, here are my captions, here are my graphics, my overlays, all the things, right? But then as soon as like the episode is done, I'm just like, download the video, send it out to the VAs and they run with it. And then podcasting just felt like this whole, like more stuff to do. And I think now that I've had live streaming under my belt for so long, now I'm comfortable with the fact of, okay, now I know what I'm getting myself into. I think if I was, I'm going to start live streaming and I'm going to podcast all at the same time, I would have been like, oh, this is actually way too much. You know, my bum needs to go outside and walk <laughs> and not be like, you know, right? Like yeah. in the yeah. office all day. 
What was really funny is that in the content marketing group uh, hosted by our good friend, Rob Balasabas, someone had posted a question and they asked, how much time do you spend a week creating video content? And I really had to sit back and think about it from not only just creating the shows and doing the pre-promotion work, someone had mentioned maybe three to five hours a week. And I was like, that's true. I was like, I, that feels intuitively that that is spot on everything from creating the copy doing all that and then repurposing it and promoting and drafting emails all that stuff how how much time would you say that once when you're working on your podcast how much time are you dedicating towards that well my podcast was <clears throat> i spent a little time every week uh for 16 weeks there were 16 episodes in season one and it took a couple hours a week because I had to um, script out what I was going to say, record it, and then edit it. And then of course upload it and, and create the art. So there was, there was a series of steps there. Um, <clears throat> you said something really interesting, which is that you were talking about not wanting to start doing podcasting when you were starting to learn live video, which is totally true. We, we tell people this all the time, right? Don't tackle every social network at the same time. Don't tackle every kind of medium of content marketing. Don't try to learn all these different things. Tackle one at a time, get really good, master that yeah. thing, whatever that thing is, and then move on to the next thing. So in this case, we're talking to live streamers who hopefully they've been live streaming for a while. And if you haven't, start there, start with live streaming, and then add the podcast later, which is a benefit because to your earlier point, not every live stream episode will be good for a podcast. But if you've already been live streaming, you can afford to skip the episodes. You know, no, just don't sweat it. You know, this episode, okay, we're not gonna do this one as a podcast, we'll do the next one. And we've got all this wonderful backlog and archive of live streams that we can repurpose. Yeah, and you know what I think it also it is too, is I think with live streaming, the audience, kind of like the audience forgiveness for the quality of your live stream is very forgiving as far as like video goes and, mm -hmm. but your audio needs to be good. But what I always heard about podcasting is that your, your audio needs to be like superb. It needs to be top of the top. Even if it's a little scratchy, like people will throw something at you. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know? And so I think that was kind of like the bigger barrier. And so now I think having this and having the Roadcaster Pro, it's, it's making me a bit more comfortable in stepping into that space. So I totally get if any of you that are watching, you're like, well, maybe not just yet. Maybe, maybe down the road. Cause I mean, I've probably been live streaming for maybe four or five years now. And this is the first time that I've actually really said, okay, Mike, I will, I'm taking a bigger step forward. I think before I was like, I'll dip my little, you know, my little pinky toe. I like the idea. <laughs> right. But now I'm just like, oh, okay. I feel like I have better resources, better understanding. I have a better, um, kind of like fluency as far as like content strategy goes too. Mm -hmm. I think live streaming was a really good playground for understanding how to create the titles, the hooks, the intros, promo copy, how to structure a show. And now I feel confident in the sense that I could take that skill set and now it's a transferable skill for podcasting. Is that kind of how like what you always felt when you moved over your stuff too? Absolutely. Uh, and it is funny how we, we push each other, right? <laughs> <laughs> to do different things, to keep growing and improving. But yeah, there's there's so much to what you just said. And I think it kind of boils down to confidence. Confidence in what you're doing and what you're saying and the processes that you're putting in place. And podcasting is a whole new thing. So if you're not confident in your content, in your message, if you're not confident in your audience, in your core processes in terms of identifying your, you know, what content you're going to create and that sort of thing, then you don't need to rush into creating a podcast. Save that until you have the confidence built up in these other areas. Okay, that's fun. Well, I think um, where this is really cool too for live streamers is, I remember when I first started live streaming, it was kind of like off the cuff. And then as the years progressed, I realized, hey, having a run of show, having like maybe even just a few bits scripted out actually makes your life easier. And even now it's like, oh, now I have a teleprompter. So I know like I could see you and do that stuff. I think it just makes it a lot easier as a content creator. And in my stream of consciousness right now, the reason why I say that is because 
there's so many of us, as you said before, they want to tackle and be everywhere. For someone like me who's been doing this for a long time, Mike has always been over like my shoulder, like, yeah, you should try this. And I was like, I'm not ready yet. I don't. So if you're not ready, I, I mean, like, I totally get you. I totally get you. Yeah. And what's funny is that once, once that new podcast show drops, I'm going to go back and listen to this. And I'll be like, if you could have told yourself five years ago, why didn't you do it? <laughs> That would have been like really, it'd be really funny. Like this could be a whole entire clip for sure. Yeah. Cool. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to Digital Confetti, where we share with you strategies and tips on how to repurpose your content all across the internet. We want to give a big, huge shout out to Restream.io for allowing us to go live on multiple platforms. And hey, if you haven't tried this before, Restream is absolutely amazing. As you just saw, I was able to bring in a guest, right? Bring in a guest, give him the opportunity to share his screen. We could look at his slides step by step. And not only that, though, but engage with you and show with you all of your comments. Now, Mike, before I let you go, I know that you have something super amazing and fun for everyone because you are pretty much like the content king. And so you have a blogging boot camp. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So the whole idea of the blogging boot camp is to give you as a student of content marketing a very structured way to figure out what it is that you actually need to create, who you need to create it for, and how you're going to go about creating it. And it ties into everything we've been talking about, whether it's live video, podcast, audio content, or written content. You need to have a plan if you want to drive traffic leads and sales. So that's really what the boot camp is for us to teach you how to discover who your audience is, how to discover what it is that they're searching on from a business perspective, right? What do they need? What problems do you need to solve? And then how do you go about figuring out what content to create to achieve that? We just had someone, I don't know why the comment doesn't show up, but someone goes, ooh, blogging boot camp. And I'm like, yes, friends. Here's the thing is that he just told you like the high level stuff, but let me chunk down for you like all the amazing things that he talks about in there. Is that cool? <laughs> because you you do a lot of the content strategy, the building blocks. I learned so much from you about the content pyramid and how all of your content should stack upon it upon themselves, why episodes are important, outlining your content. But here's the other thing too is that, like I said before, I always call Mike like the brain. And so there are times where I'm just like, hey, how, how can I improve this from an SEO perspective? And that's where all of a sudden, like he gets giddy and super excited and he'll tell you all the things. And that's what I love about the blogging bootcamp is because you, you introduce us to so many tools like SEM Rush, how it's important, Google keyword planners, all the different things. Um, and now you're even showing them how to do like podcasting. So there's so many different resources that are here. Johnny, who is just tuning in, he's saying, um, Stephanie Lou, yep, it takes extra effort, but it's got to be done. <laughs> exactly. But if you, again, if you want to create more content, join the blogging boot camp, right? So when does this officially start? Is it one of those things that you could just jump in whenever, or is it like we kick off on a certain day? Yeah, it's open enrollment. Everything is pre-recorded. You'll get into a Thinkific platform where you can just go through the main 10 modules at your pace. You could go through them in a day. You, you could take a couple months, whatever you want to go through. The cool thing there is I'll be able to watch and see, right, as the, as the course owner, uh, who's going through and what progress you're making. So I can check in on you. And we, of course, we have a, a Facebook group, a private community where you can share your successes and your challenges. You can ping me up with you when you have questions, when you get stuck. We do office hours and that sort of thing. So it's very much uh, at your pace. However, quickly you want to start creating content that actually drives business results. That's the thing that you just glossed over was like, oh, and we have office hours. You guys, office hours. Remember like when you were in school and your professor, your instructor was like, hey, if you have questions come into office hours and you never used it. And now you look back, you're like, damn it. Had I just asked that one question, I could have aced that test. This is how you are going to ace whatever it is that you put out on the internet with the content that you create. So I love the fact that you have these office hours to introduce people to. Uh, someone is saying, uh, great idea to put it on Thinkific. Yeah, I love it when when courses are put on an actual course provider platform. 
because then I feel like the instructor takes it a lot more seriously as far as like the quality and you get the analytics to know how your students are performing. Whereas sometimes Facebook groups, like content is there, you know, it's funky and whatnot, but how much is it? Tell me about that. It's only two ninety seven, which I mean, I charge you more for an hour to be perfectly frank. My hourly rates two fifty, and I really don't even, don't even do consulting anymore. So, for two ninety seven, you get lifetime access to all the training modules. There's a bunch of bonus videos, and I'll keep adding those. You get a content marketing workbook. You get my blogging planner for free for the year, and of course, access to the group. And so, okay, okay, that's a that's a freaking steal. So two ninety seven. But then, how often are your office hours? Are your students limited to how many office hours, or it's just when the boot camp runs? They they could always talk to you. <laughs> they can always talk to me. Yeah, and I do live office hours. Don't have a quite a set schedule yet. It's probably going to be monthly on Saturdays or something like that. But th they're just live videos in the Facebook group, so you can always show up. You can always post into the group. You can always email me or direct message me if you have questions, which is what most of the students have done. They just go to the community when they have a question and they pop it in the group and they say, "Hey, Mike, I was watching this about content pyramids." can I reuse these articles that I've already published? And I say, yeah, absolutely. You can totally reuse the articles you've already published. And, you know, and that makes sense in the context of the group. So take advantage of it. <gasps> That's awesome. That's amazing. And everyone that wraps up our show today on how to turn your live stream into a podcast. Again, if you have any questions, ask the blogging brute, ask Mike Alton. It sounds like he's making himself accessible. So I'm a little jealous because I'm like, but, but you're, you're my brain. <laughs> but this is your opportunity to get to know him as you know here at digital confetti i just always want to introduce you to the absolute rock star marketers that are in my life mike alton for sure is definitely one of those having said that thank you to the whole entire crew ta ta johnny christos the whole entire crew thank you so much for being here and with that take care everyone thank you mike you're amazing bye friends thanks for having me yay